Welcome to this teaching on the Last Supper, which we have subtitled, A Betrothal Protocol. The inspiration for this teaching came as a result of many discrepancies that many have struggled with concerning certain events that transpire during the Last Supper which don't seem to fit a Passover ritual. That is to say, was the Last Supper actually a Passover ritual, or was it something else? In addition, many of the events that are contained within the Passover ritual are not found at the Last Supper. For instance, there is no mention of bitter herbs. The bread that Jesus used is indicated in the Greek to be a leavened loaf, as opposed to unleavened bread. There was the drinking of wine at the Last Supper, and wine was not part of the original format for a Passover ritual. In addition, the lambs that were used and consumed by the children of Israel were sacrificed and offered to God on the 14th day of that month, that month being called Abib or Nisan. Jesus was crucified on that same day at the same hour in which these lambs were sacrificed and offered to God. That is why Jesus is called the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He's also called our Passover. Those lambs are only sacrificed and offered to God on the 14th of Nisan. The Last Supper was on the 13th of Nisan. There is also the issue of the Passover ritual only being conducted once a year with a second Passover to be conducted for those who missed the first one a month later. Yet Jesus told us that every time we gather together we should perform this ritual in remembrance of Him. Was Jesus saying we are to perform a Passover ritual every time we get together? That would violate Passover. With that in mind, we ask the question, could there be a different protocol in play here? And indeed there was. Many of the words said, the phrases used, and the acts played out by Christ during the Last Supper are very common to the Hebrew betrothal protocol. Some of them are very specific, in fact. This is not to say that the Last Supper did not include blood atonement protocol, that is to say, elements which would speak of New Testament salvation legalities. Salvation elements are definitely contained within the Last Supper. However, there may have been a greater purpose for the Last Supper, a greater message, and that was Jesus proposing to his church, Jesus proposing to his disciples. It could very well be that God orchestrating the Last Supper the way he did puts a decision before every believer. Do we just have enough relationship with God to meet salvation, or do we hunger and pursue a deeper relationship with the Lord, such being on a betrothal level? It appears that what God wants is the deepest relationship we can have with Jesus. All the appointed feasts of God point to the marriage of the Lamb. However, many are called but few are chosen. And it's highly probable that the reason that so few are chosen is because so few choose. Many will only go as far as Passover, but they will not embrace and pursue the betrothal. With that in mind, this teaching will examine the Passover protocols and it will examine the betrothal protocols. Then it will compare them to the events that transpired during the Last Supper. And you can decide at that point if the Last Supper was truly a Passover ritual or a betrothal supper. The first thing we must do is get on God's calendar. And in order to do this, we must define what a Hebrew day consists of. A Hebrew day starts and ends at sunset. In other words, when the sun is going down, that is when the day is waning and ending. Once the sun dips below the horizon, that starts the new day. This is important when reading modern translations because in certain passages it will talk about evening or morning. And that's very important when dialing in the timeline that you're examining. This becomes extremely critical when we attempt to lay out events as they unfold in a Hebrew day or a Hebrew event, such as Passover. So you must understand that a Hebrew day begins at sunset. It's different from the Gregorian day that we're used to, where the day begins at midnight. In other words, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. That's what we're used to. The Hebrew day is sunset, and that's not necessarily a set time of the day every day. Rather, it fluctuates according to the time of year. That also means that the hour 
fluctuates as far as its length. So in the summer, the 12 hours of the day are actually more than 12 hours that we would be used to. It would probably be closer to 14 hours. But there are 12 segments of time in which the day is separated when the sun is up. Jesus said there are 12 hours in the day. And what he was saying was there are 12 segments of light during the time when the sun is up. So the first hour of the day would begin at sunrise. Let me be just a little bit more specific to help clear up any confusion. The 24-hour Hebrew day starts at sunset. The first hour of the 12 hours or the 12 segments of daylight time obviously begins at sunrise. So one has to be careful when they're talking about the word day if they're referring to a 24-hour period or 24-segmented period or are they talking about the 12 hours of light or the 12 segments of light during the time when the sun is up and the 12 segments of time when the sun is down. You have to make that discernment when you're examining a particular scripture or verse. So in scripture, when it's referring to the Passover or the crucifixion of Christ, when it talks of the sixth hour of the day, that would be when the sun is at its highest place in the sky. That would be noon. Now, not necessarily our noon, but it would be what they're used to, which is when the sun is at its peak elevation in the sky. The ninth hour would then be three segments of time later, which would correspond closely to three, four o'clock in the afternoon. So in the Old Testament, when it talks about taking a lamb and slaying it in the evening, well, the evening time would be from the sixth hour to the setting of the sun. It's still part of the daylight time. So just to reiterate, the Hebrew day begins and ends at sunset. The 12 hours of the day begins at sunrise because there's 12 hours of the day and there's 12 hours of the night. The sixth hour would correspond to when the sun is at its highest peak of elevation in the sky. Pretty simple. Now, When it comes to the days of the week, the days were numbered. They did not usually assign names to these days as we do. Unfortunately, with our Gregorian calendar, we've assigned names to the days of the week after gods. The Hebrews did not do this. They number their days, the first day of the week, the second day of the week, the fifth day of the week, the seventh day of the week. And God worked six days, and he rested on the seventh day. And this helps us out when we get to passages that talk about the women arriving at the tomb on the first day of the week. That suggests that the day before was the seventh day of the week, which was a Sabbath, a weekly Sabbath, as opposed to a high Sabbath. And once you start understanding how a Hebrew day works, and how a Hebrew week works, and how a Hebrew month and year works, then you can start developing an accurate timeline. Now before we start examining the fine points of the Passover ritual, it's important to take a quick look at three feasts of God. Those three feasts are the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that most people call Passover. Then there's the Feast of Weeks, that's commonly known as Pentecost. And then the Feast of Ingathering, which is commonly known as Tabernacles. Now the word Passover is not a Hebrew term. It was assigned by translators very early on in the New Testament, which everybody understood to be the passing over of the angel of death passing over the children of Israel and those who put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. So the word Passover stuck. However, the Hebrew word is a different word and it means offering. That offering obviously was a lamb, a year of age or younger, and it was prepared, that is to say it was sacrificed and offered to God on the 14th of Abib. That month is also known as Nisan. And when the sun went down, the children of Israel partook of that lamb that partaking or the consuming of the lamb was on the 15th day. In other words, the preparation is the 14th of Nisan, the partaking is on the 15th of Nisan, just a few hours later. Now there are multiple passages in the Old Testament that speak of these feasts. One is Exodus 23, 14 through 17. That passage reads, Three times thou shalt keep the feast unto me in the year. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread in the time appointed of the month of Abib. Verse 16 says, And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, that would be Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks, and the feast of ingathering, that would be tabernacles, which is in the end of the year when thou hast gathered thy labors out of the field. 
Three times in the year all thy males shall appear before the Lord God. This is also expressed in Exodus 34, 18-32. Now these feasts have titles assigned to them. The first title is feast, and it means literally a feast or a gathering of an assembly. You also see there in that passage the word appointed. These are appointed feasts of God. In other words, God made an appointment with his children. Finally, they are called convocations or a holy convocation. And the Hebrew for convocation means a public meeting inasmuch as those meeting are conducting a dress rehearsal or a trial run. It can be stated that each one of these feasts or dress rehearsals are a prophetic act. Each one of these prophetic acts pointed to a future event. Obviously Passover, or I should say the lamb offering, which started the Feast of Unleavened Bread, was a prophetic act carried out by the children of Israel pointing to Jesus being crucified for our sins. Pentecost pointed to the infilling of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2. Tabernacles hasn't been completed yet, hasn't been experienced yet. That points more towards the millennial reign of Christ and going into eternity with God. The importance of looking at these three feasts real quickly is in the hope that you will see the seriousness that God puts on these appointed times and that every jot and tittle that is attributed with the protocols of these specific appointed times must come to pass as they were prophetically ordained. And Jesus did exactly that. Jesus fulfilled every nuance, every jot and tittle, every little detail of the lamb sacrifice, of the offering to God, of the feast of unleavened bread. He completed and performed the giving of the Holy Spirit, that is the oil, to his believers at Pentecost. And he will fulfill the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. He fulfilled those protocols. He did not violate them. This is important to know because when you look at the protocol for the Passover ritual in comparison to the Last Supper, there has to be an exact match of protocols, else Passover was violated by Christ and his disciples. And Jesus said he came to fulfill the law, which he did. He fulfilled those protocols. Now we're going to look specifically at the Feast of the Seven Days of Unleavened Bread. To determine when that's going to happen, the priests would look for a new moon coinciding with the spring equinox at the same time of the ripening of the barley wheat. The barley wheat is necessary because it is used in the wave offering. It is called the first fruits. Now here in lines a major problem. What the Hebrew culture or the Hebrew church or whatever you want to call it came up with when using the spring equinox is that it produces a Passover date from mid-March to up to the, about the third week in April. I did a deep dive study on 50 Passovers from the year 2000 to 2050. The earliest was March 26th, the latest was April 25th. The problem with those March dates is that the barley is never ripe enough to be harvested in March. So for March 26th date of Passover, the Rosh Hashanah, or the harvesting of the barley, would have to take place two weeks before that, which is in the middle of March. That barley grain is completely green at that point, and the kernels are not developed. And we saw in Exodus 9.31, that when God in one of the plagues smote the barley of Egypt, it was ripe. So for the first Passover that the children of Israel experienced, that being the Passover of Exodus, the barley was ripe when Moses had the children of Israel harvest the barley, and it was harvested before they left Egypt, because that barley harvest sustained three and a half million Hebrews for 30 days before they ran out of the barley, at which time God instituted the manna from heaven and the seven-day work week. And that barley had to be harvested, threshed, winnowed, and bagged up, ready to go for the exodus. And the last thing they did, once that was all completed, was they sacrificed the lambs and put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. And that was not conducted using the spring equinox. It was conducted based on the ripeness of the barley. Now this is all examined in detail in a study that's on my YouTube channel called Passover Pentecost Lost. And it presents proof that God's Passovers are in April and May, and never in the month of March. And we even did a deep dive into trying to find the day of the year 
that Moses and the children of Israel came out of Egypt in the Exodus. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to when that happened, but we think we got it dialed in. What we did was we went back to the dates that most theologians and scholars believe when the Exodus happened. Then we looked for three consecutive blood moon tetrads on or about that time. Most scholars believe that the Exodus was in 1250 to 1275 B.C. So we went back to 1225 B.C. up to 1300 B.C. And with the help of the virtual planetary software called Stellarium, we looked for three blood moon tetrads in sequence on a timeline of about 20 to 25 years. We did that because that's what we're currently in. We are currently in a three blood moon tetrad sequence the first being in 2014 to 2015. We are currently in one, which started last year in 2021. It will conclude this year in 2022. And then in 10 years, there will be a third on 2032 to the year 2033. And on that I card in the upper right hand corner, you put your cursor up there, you'll see that I card. You can pull that down and that'll send you to a five part series on dozens of alleged prophetic dreams over the last 10 years concerning two moons and or four moons, all of which seem to illuminate the first two weeks of May 2022, showing that something big is going to happen on or about May 16th, which is a super blood moon. And this May 16th super blood moon happens to be the third blood moon of the current tetrad we're in, and the current tetrad we're in is the middle of the three tetrads that I just mentioned. This is almost identical to what we found back in 2062 BC, which also is the third full super blood moon of a tetrad, and that tetrad is between two other tetrads on a timeline of about 20 to 25 years. And a closer look at this specific blood moon shows us that it is one of the biggest blood moons in the history of mankind. I mean, this thing is huge. In addition, it is the only blood moon of the six Passover date blood moons, that being a date in either April or May, that has that super blood moon beginning around midnight and going into full red blood moon eclipse at about 3 to 4 a.m. in the morning, Egypt time. None of the other five blood moons that would land on or about a Passover season, that being in April or May, manifest a blood moon between midnight and 4 a.m. And we found this using that virtual planetary software called Solarium. So how do you think God dialed this up? The Exodus was Moses' Passover, obviously, and the firstborn of anyone not under the blood of the Lamb fell over dead. So picture yourself back there in Egypt at midnight. The moon is starting to turn blood red, and people are screaming and going crazy, many of them which are falling over dead. And they look out their window and they see a full, huge, super blood moon. I'm pretty confident that God purposely dialed it in that way to present a strong message to both the children of Egypt and the children of Israel. And you see up on your screen there the dates of all those blood moons. In particular, what I'm confident is the Passover of Exodus. Take a look at the date that the computer came up with, the 10th of May. So I am extremely confident that the first Passover was in May, almost the middle of May. And when we use the spring equinox as the chief denominator to determine when Passover is supposed to be, and that equation never, never produces a May Passover, which has been the case with the Jewish nation ever since coming out of Babylon, well then it's obvious to me they got the wrong equation. You don't use the spring equinox you use the ripeness of the barley and you don't harvest it until it's ripe because it is an omar or a handful of that ripe barley that is taken by the barley farmer when he presents himself to God at Passover that after Passover he brings it to the temple where it is given to a priest that puts it in a bowl crushes it or profanes it as it's called and then roasts it and then they have communion of that barley the farmer, the priest, and God. And God gets the first bite. He gets the first fruit. The barley harvest is not to be partaken of until after that first fruit is experienced by God in the first fruit wave offering. Once that is done, then they can go to their barns and their bins and they can start consuming that barley. But God gets the first bite.
So I recommend you go to my YouTube channel and check out this very in-depth study on how Passover is to be determined. And God's true Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the first month of the Hebrew calendar that God gave Moses in Exodus 2.12, and you get to see how Moses and the children of Israel did it, as opposed to a compromised Hebrew nation that practiced that calendar when they were in their Babylonian captivity. But the study we're currently in is focusing on the Passover Seder and the many, many discrepancies and differences that show that the Last Supper was a formal betrothal dinner and not a Passover Seder. Regardless, we first have to find that month of the Abib to discover both God's true Rosh Hashanah and when Passover is to be conducted. Now I'm reluctant to use the word Nisan because that is a Babylonian god. In fact, all the titles of the Hebrew months currently used and used at the time of Christ were named after the Babylonian gods that Israel served while they were in Babylon. God never entitled any of his months or his days. It was the first month, second month, tenth month, eleventh month, seventh month, first day, second day, fifth day, fourth day. It was man and religious leaders that assigned titles to these days and months, and fortunately, almost all of them are named after gods, and in the case of the Hebrew calendar, all of them are named after Babylonian gods. But you'll hear me use the word Nisan because it is so well recognized and utilized by the church world and by religious leaders. They know exactly what I'm talking about, so I apologize for using the name, but it just makes things faster and easier. If I had my way, that title would be revoked. And we'd say it the way God said it. This is your month of the Aviv, or Abib, or this is the month of Passover. And in Exodus 12, 2, God says, this is the first day of the first month of your year. That's the only time he assigned the head of the year. That was in Exodus 12, 2. It was not the seventh Hebrew month, which the Hebrew religious nation assigned as their secular calendar. God's not interested in a secular calendar. He's interested in his calendar. And all things spring from that first day of that first month. And that's the first day of the month when the barley is ripe and harvested. And that first day is determined by the sighting of a sliver crescent moon. Not a full moon and not a fully waned dead moon, but a sliver crescent moon that's bursting out of the darkness of three days of darkness before that. And yes, now we have something new in the heavens, new in the sky. It's a new moon. And when that day is witnessed by two witnesses, it produces a declaration of the first day of the Hebrew month. So look to Moses, how Moses did it, to determine how it's supposed to be done. Because that is what Jesus fulfilled. He came and fulfilled and confirmed the blood covenant of Moses with many, including the calendar. So once we find that first sliver crescent moon on the month that the ripe barley is harvested and processed and put in the granary and in the barns, then we have the first day of the month of Aviv. Once that is determined, they know that that is the month of Abib, or Nisan. Exodus 12, 2. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Look at verses 3 through 6. In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb. Notice, they don't take a sheep. They take a lamb. There's an age factor that's part of this equation. And that age factor is very important. It speaks to innocence. Your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year. In other words, it's got to be a year or younger in age. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Remember on the slide that defined what a Hebrew day is? You saw where the evening was. Well, this is when that lamb was to be slain and offered to God. So real quick, you look for that first sliver of the moon, and that's the first day of the month. You count ten days, and that is when you choose the lamb. Then you watch that lamb for four days. Normally they would choose that lamb between the third and sixth hour of the day, and then you start watching it. So from the tenth to the eleventh, to the twelfth, to the thirteenth, to the fourteenth of Nisan, that's four days in which you watch this lamb. And all during those four days, you're taking care of this little thing. You're feeding it, you're keeping it clean, you're keeping it warm, you're keeping it out of harm's way. You're actually bonding to it. And then you take it and you kill it. You would think that God designed into this whole process something having to do with invoking emotion within the heart of those participating. 
Yeah, that's what it's all about. God's trying to draw emotion out of us. That emotion being, look what our sins have done. Our sins have destroyed innocence. We are responsible for this tragedy on some level. So on the evening of the 14th, this is when the lamb is slaughtered or sacrificed and is offered to God. And as concerning with Moses and the children of Israel in Egypt, the passing over did not take until they were six hours into the 15th of Nisan. For God said that he would pass over those that had put blood on their doorposts, and that would happen at the mid of night or midnight. And that was on the 15th. And in the morning of the 15th, the children of Israel completed the partaking of the lamb. They girded themselves, and they journeyed out of Egypt. Numbers 33, 3. And they departed from Ramses in the first month. Remember, we're talking the first month of God's calendar. The first month on the 15th day of the first month, on the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians. It stands to reason that they went out in the morning time, because it says on the morrow, and that the Egyptians actually witnessed this. They can't witness it if it's in the dark of night. So what it looks like is when the sun came up on the 15th of Nisan, the children of Israel left Egypt. Now let's dial in some of the protocols involved in the sacrifice and the partaking of the lamb. Exodus 12, 7 through 10. Put some of the blood on your door frames. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. Now I challenge anybody to find in that passage or any passage concerning the protocols of the Passover ritual where they partook of wine or as they practice today, they include eggs, applesauce, sugared cinnamon added. Some actually use lamb or sheep that are older than a year and they will cut the bone, cut the flank which violates the bone or breaks the bone and part of the protocol that God stated is you don't break the bone. That is a prophetic reference for Jesus being on the cross where they did not break his legs to end his life because he was already dead. My point is there is only three items that were used in the Passover protocol and that was a lamb of a year or younger of age, bitter herbs, and unleavened bread. That's it and we'll discover later that none of these were included in the Last Supper. Neither did they gird themselves up at the Last Supper. These are all part of the protocol for the Passover ritual. Continuing in Exodus verse 9, Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left over till morning, you must burn it. Deuteronomy 16.7 Roast it and eat it in the place that the Lord your God will choose. Then in the morning return to your tents. In other words, you don't leave the dwelling place until morning. What happened at the Last Supper? When it got dark, they got up and went to the garden. That would have been a violation of the Passover ritual, if indeed it was Passover. And they were looking for any excuse to crucify Christ. If Christ was violating Passover, they would have nailed him to the cross with that alone. So let's take the time to actually look at what God instructed Moses and Israel and the generations that followed them on how to perform a Passover Seder. This is Exodus 12, 3 through 14. We'll cover it many times throughout the video. First look at verse 14. This is a feast to the Lord, to Yahweh, Yahweh, throughout your generation, and you shall keep the ordinance forever. The Hebrew word talks about you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever can be translated you shall celebrate it forever you shall dance with it forever it has to do with dancing I think the best word that's used you shall observe it forever and the Hebrew word there forever is the word antiquity most often translated as everlasting forevermore forever very long permanent so is God saying that today we should go out and sacrifice a lamb? No, I think the better understanding of that for today is that it is fulfilled in Christ. And we don't have a temple to sacrifice lambs in, which was part of the protocol back in the day of Christ, because now Christ is that temple. And God instructed Moses that this sacrifice would only take place where God put his name. Well, before Christ came on scene, that was the temple in Jerusalem. And now that Christ is that temple and is that sacrifice, and since God's name is in Christ, Yahshua, 
which means Yahweh or Jehovah saves, we fulfill that commandment from God by being in Christ and embracing the blood sacrifice that he performed, that blood sacrifice that he became. And when we by faith put that blood on our lives and we are covered by that blood, then we have fulfilled Passover as our Heavenly Father intended it to be fulfilled in our personal lives. That should be clear. That's basic salvation 101. But the purpose of this video is to show you that the Last Supper was not a Passover Seder. The word Seder means protocol. You follow a sequence of events that are spelled out in a protocol. One event, then the next, then the next, then the next. Think of it as a recipe. If you don't follow the recipe, your souffle is going to flop. And the Passover Seder that was given to Moses, that was practiced by Moses, that was given to the generations that followed Moses, is spelled out with specific parameters. Each one Jesus had to fulfill if he truly came to confirm and fulfill the covenant of Moses. Well, it's easy to see he did that on the cross, but did he do that at the Last Supper if the Last Supper is supposed to be understood and embraced as a Passover Seder? Well, let's look at God's instructions. Exodus 12, verse 3. On the tenth day of the month, you shall take a male lamb. Now, this can also be a male goat. So if they took a female lamb or a female goat, that would violate the recipe. That would violate the covenant. And again, I emphasize, this is a lamb. It is not a full-grown sheep or an adolescent sheep. It is a male lamb or goat that's less than a year old. And real quick, this kind of ties into our understanding of the birth of Christ because the Hebrew nation had to produce hundreds of thousands of lambs for each Passover. They actually had a course of priests that were shepherds. And this is what they did 24-7. They raised lambs. So that when Passover showed up, they could sell these lambs to these pilgrims coming in from all over Jerusalem and from various nations who really did not have the resources to be carrying a lamb around as they traveled to Jerusalem for Passover. And where did they raise these lambs? In Bethlehem. So when Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem because of the census and they could not find any room at the inn, it was because it was during the Festival of Tabernacles, one of the three festivals that the men of Israel were supposed to present themselves before God at the temple. Thus all the inns were packed full and Mary and Joseph were left out in the cold. And where did they go? They went to the birthing stables where the lambs were birthed. At that time, the stables were empty because this chorus of priests, or I should say shepherd priests, were tending to the flocks out in the fields. That way they didn't have to feed them or clean up after them. They are out in the fields. Thus, the birthing stables were empty. And that's where you find swaddling clothes because the swaddling clothes were the worn-out garments of these shepherd priests, and they would tear them into strips and use them at the birthing time in the spring where they'd wrap the lambs so the lambs wouldn't get up, freak out, and slam themselves into the wall and cut themselves, which would make them blemished. And there it is. Verse 5, your lamb should be without blemish, a male of the first year, sheep or goats. And by swaddling the sheep and laying them in a manger, they would calm down after they were just newly birthed, and then they would take the swaddling strips off of them, and the lambs would be fine. They wouldn't be cutting themselves or bruising themselves. Thus, Joseph and Mary had something to wrap Jesus in to keep him warm and to keep him clean. And they laid him in a manger. So when Jesus was born, he was born where the sacrificial lambs were born, and he was wrapped in priestly garments. Isn't that a prophecy fulfilled? Pretty cool, huh? So getting back to the crucifixion of a lamb, and that's what Passover was, it was an innocent lamb being crucified. That's exactly what it was. And God was using it to point to what was going to happen to his only begotten son, his only begotten Adam, his firstborn, his first fruit. God enacted that crucifixion every year at Passover. And it wasn't a pretty sight. Passover is not supposed to be warm and fuzzy. It's supposed to be ugly and horrific. Or since when is a crucifixion of a lamb something that's warm and fuzzy? Look at this. You take it on the 10th day, you watch it until the 14th day. You're bonding to this thing. you got a little lamb there. You're bonding to it. And then in verse 6, what do you do? You kill it. The word evening there is from high noon to the setting of the sun. That is a Hebrew evening. 
I'm sure you all know that you take the blood and you strike the two side posts and the upper door posts at the individual houses that the children of Israel were staying in, and that alerted the angel of death that God sent through all of Egypt to pass over. I know very few people think of this, but I bet there were some Hebrews that did not put that blood on their doorposts. Guess what happened to them? The same thing that happened to the Egyptians. Now here are some of the parameters that most people don't realize and is rarely practiced in today's Hebrew Passover and certainly was not part of the Last Supper, which it had to be if it was a Passover Seder for Jesus to confirm, which means to fulfill, which means to practice, which means he actually would have to engage these protocols. If Jesus truly came to confirm and fulfill the Passover Seder, you would see him doing these things at the Last Supper if the Last Supper was a Passover Seder. Verse 8, you eat it at night. Well, first of all, the Last Supper started probably about high noon or just a little bit after that, and they went through the meal, and then they went out into the night, which means they had the supper during daylight. And I'm yet to see a lamb at all at the Last Supper, especially one that was supposed to be watched for four days. And Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a small donkey on the 10th of the V of month. That's the day you choose the lamb. That's the day that God, as it were, chose Christ as the lamb on the 10th day, which is the instruction from verse 3. Jesus was presented as the lamb of God on the 10th day. They watched him for four days and then they crucified him just like you do the, the lamb. You choose the lamb on the 10th day, you watch it till the 14th day, then you crucify that Paschal lamb. Well, the Last Supper was on the 13th, so the lamb could not have been watched for four days, and it could not be sacrificed until the 14th day. So if they did happen to watch a lamb, they only watched it for three days, and they sacrificed it on the 13th, somebody did, and you don't sacrifice the sacrificial lamb on the 13th, you sacrifice it on the 14th of the month of Aviv. And that was fulfilled by Christ on the cross, not at the Last Supper. Verse 8 again, Then you take this thing and you roast it in fire, and you eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Where's the bitter herbs in the Last Supper? When and where did they roast this lamb that they couldn't sacrifice in the first place? Where was a lamb? Oh, it was in the sop that they were dipping the bread into. <laughs> leavened bread, by the way. Well, sop is like a stew or a soup, if there's even any meat involved in the first place. Look at verse 9. Do not eat it raw. Do not boil it in water. Sop is a water-based stew. Whatever's in there, it got boiled. So if that was meant to be a Passover ritual ordinance, then Jesus violated the law because he ate, allegedly, lamb in this stew, in this sop, which would be in disobedience to his father's direct instructions in Ezekiel 12. So how would that equate to Jesus fulfilling and confirming the blood covenant of Moses? It's not. It would be Jesus violating the Passover ordinance and the Passover Seder if the Last Supper was a Passover Seder. I contend that based on the actions that Jesus performed at the Last Supper that it is not a Passover Seder. Yet it fits perfectly with the Hebrew betrothal protocol. Hmm, I wonder which one we should really focus on. Also note, you don't dress the lamb out. The head remains on it, the legs and hooves remain on it, and this might be the most important part. The entrails are left in the body of the lamb to be roasted. And I also contend that you leave the fur or hair on it as well as its hide. You take the entire animal minus its blood because the blood was drained from it and poured out on the altar back in Jesus' day. And in Moses' day, they took the blood and they slapped it on their doorposts. So what makes me think you're supposed to leave the hide and the fleece on the sacrificial lamb? Well, first of all, if you skin an animal, their entrails will fall out. And one of the things that is specifically mentioned is you leave the entrails in. By removing the hide, there is nothing holding those entrails in place any longer. I don't know if you've ever seen a deer dressed out or a small mammal like a goat or a sheep or a pig. The abdomen is wrapped by the hide and that's what holds the guts in. Second of all, there's no time to remove the hide or to shear the lamb to make it more palatable when it's roasted. Third, there are no instructions to remove the hide and the fleece. And the reason I believe God meant for that hide and fleece to remain on the animal, not only to hold the entrails in place, is because this is a crucifixion. You are crucifying a lamb. Now the pictures on the left 
are what some Samaritans do during present day as far as getting ready for a Passover Seder. First of all, it looks like they're using a full-grown sheep. Second of all, it's totally skinned, and you can see the abdominal cavity open. There's no intestines there. They removed the intestines. But that's for the Samaritans. This picture, we have what appears to be some Hebrew priests, and they have what looks like to be a lamb or a goat on a spit, and they're carrying it. Well, they got the part right where they leave the head in place and the legs in place, but it's skinned. The body cavity is open. There are no entrails. And in these pictures, the animal looks quite washed and the environment sterilized. That's not what a crucifixion is. Now take a look at the picture on the right. This happens to be a kangaroo about the size of a lamb that was caught in one of the fires here a few years ago. So to say the least, the thing was roasted. That looks like a crucifixion. So let me ask you, why do you think God dialed it up the way he did if he just meant it to be a barbecue, which you see on the left? On the right, more reflects what a crucifixion would look like. And isn't that what God was trying to do? He was trying to create an atmosphere and an audiovisual and an olfactory, or the smell, that would paint a picture of a crucifixion. Now we are told that the appointed times of God are reenactments of what Moses did when performing God's appointed times. But each performance of what Moses did was a pre-enactment of what Christ would do. They were all prophetic acts. Thus, I lean heavily towards the total roasting of the Paschal lamb, which included the hide and the fleece remaining on the body in order to hold the entrails in place and to produce a very ugly, uncomfortable, smelly presentation that would represent Christ on the cross. So you can make up your mind, God either planned for a barbecue or he wanted to show a crucifixion, a pre-enactment of what his son would face. And speaking after the manner of man, I think God hoped that the children of Israel would recognize what happened when they witnessed the Son of Glory being crucified on the cross. Hey, this is what Passover is all about. We've been doing this every generation since Moses. We should have known that this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But they were blinded and they didn't see it. And sad to say, they still don't see it and don't want to see it. But that crucified Lamb that they were supposed to crucify every year on the day of preparation for Passover was the confirmation that Jesus was that sacrifice. So basically you have the entire animal and they would put it on a spit in the form of a cross and they, they would shove this into an oven and roast it. You know what happens to hair and hide in an oven? It burns and it smells and the entrails will expand and sometimes explode. Well, you're kind of seeing what happened on the cross with Christ. Like I said, you are crucifying a lamb. And God did not mean it to be a barbecue with honey barbecue sauce marinating the meat of a full-grown lamb. No, they took this lamb, shoved it into an oven, nothing but stench coming out. Then you take it out and you rip the meat off of it and consume it. Where did that happen at the Last Supper? Where is that happening today in today's Passover rituals that people follow? A lot of them don't even use lamb. They'll use a fish, they'll use turkey, they'll use chicken. I'm surprised they don't use pork. Some probably do. And look at verse 10. And anything that remains until morning you shall burn with a fire. In other words, that little lamb, what's ever left over, it's to be fully consumed. And of course, you're not going to consume the bones. You're not going to consume the hide and the burnt hair or burnt wool. So you take it, you throw it back in the fire and make sure it turns to ash. So when did that happen after the Last Supper? I'll remind you that the rooster crowed when Peter denied Christ at his trial. Roosters normally crow around twilight. So from the time they finished the Last Supper to the time they went into the garden to where Jesus was arrested, to the trial, to the crowing of the rooster, nobody was attending to this crucified lamb. So yet another violation if that was a Passover Seder. And all during this Passover Seder, your loins are supposed to be girded and your shoes on your feet to reenact the state of emergency that the children of Israel were under during the Exodus, showing their readiness and preparedness to beat feet away from Pharaoh. Where do we see that in the Last Supper? Nowhere, because we don't even see a lamb with the disciples ripping the flesh off it to eat that flesh with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. We don't see any of that. And all of that is required by God when performing the Passover Seder. And I will heavily emphasize, the Passover Seder is supposed to be a crucifixion of an innocent lamb. 
I don't think I have to explain the reason for that and the typology behind that. It's pointing to Christ where that was performed on him and by him the next day after the Last Supper, when our Lamb of God that takes away of the sins of the world was crucified. And the only thing left of Christ after he died on the cross was everything you saw with that Lamb. The head, the hands, the body were still intact, the bones were not broken, that's a prophetic, but all his blood was gone. For all practical and real purposes, Jesus bled out after having his flesh ripped off his body at the scourging and the nailing on the cross. That was the fulfillment of the Passover Seder. Jesus was butchered and crucified at the very hour, at the very minute, that these sacrificial lambs were taken up to the temple's altar. They had their necks slit, blood drained, belly slit, and put on a spit in the shape of a cross and roasted. And Jesus was put in the tomb and he experienced the roasting of hell that we all deserve and he didn't and it was a complete sacrifice just as the lamb is completely consumed so was Christ just as the red heifer offering is completely consumed so was Christ and quickly look at John 13 verse 29 I'll read it to you for some of them thought because Judas had the bag of money that Jesus said unto him buy those things that we have need of against the feast and we know what feast that was, or that he should give something to the poor. My point is here, things we need of against the feast would be purchasing bitter herbs, unleavened bread, and a lamb. Which means at the Last Supper, they didn't have the lamb yet. It wasn't purchased yet. So, no, there was no lamb, no bitter herbs, no unleavened bread at the Last Supper. The unleavened bread is prepared on the 14th, and the lamb is slain and prepared on the 14th. The Last Supper was on the 13th. There is your scriptural proof that there was no lamb at the Last Supper. Those items hadn't been purchased yet. So in today's modern Passover, they can't see Christ because it's a barbecue. It's a Thanksgiving dinner. And great, have a Thanksgiving dinner. You can have those any day of the week, any day of the year. But the ordinance that God commands us to observe forever that's specific, and that's on one day of the year, and we should observe that in Christ. And maybe if the Hebrews, and for that matter the entire world, understands what it means to crucify a lamb, well maybe they'll see Christ. And that's where it starts. But the Last Supper, it was something incredible. It was for why Jesus freely allowed himself to be put on that cross. Because on that cross, he purchased his bride. And I hope I expressed that clearly throughout this video. And if you haven't figured it out by now, yes, I have spliced in different parts and pieces of this as this video has evolved since I started it back in 2015. That's why we get some bad sound quality and different voice inflections and stuff like that. But the entire message has been the same. I've just been able to add to it to make this video more complete and the resulting message more clear. So I apologize for the discrepancies in my visuals and in my audios but this is what I have to work with. And if you look at these Seder events, and if you look at the betrothal events, it should be crystal clear that the Last Supper was something extremely special. And it should be understood and embraced as just that. It's Jesus proposing. And I would appreciate it if you could put up with the much redundancy that results from me going back and splicing things in. But it's probably a good thing, because it's worth hearing multiple times. And continuing, there is more of the covenant of Moses for Jesus to confirm. Let's look at the seven days of unleavened bread. Exodus 12, 15 through 19 helps define more of the seven days that follows. That would be the seven days of unleavened bread. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. Whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh day must be cut off from Israel. Verse 16 says, On the first day hold a sacred assembly also known as a high Sabbath, and one on the seventh day. So the first day of the seven days of unleavened bread and the last day, the seventh day, both are high Sabbaths. Do no work at all on these days, except to prepare food. You shall observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. We still are supposed to be recognizing Passover on some level. It says we're supposed to observe this day as an ordinance forever doesn't say until Messiah comes. Now in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 45, verses 21 through 25, Ezekiel is speaking of a prince 
who performs burnt offerings to the Lord in the millennial temple. Now it is unlawful for anyone of a kingly lineage to perform sacrifices unless they are of the order of Melchizedek. And there are only two people mentioned in the Bible who are of the order of Melchizedek. That would be Melchizedek himself and Jesus Christ. And since Ezekiel is speaking of the millennial temple, I would assume that this prince is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And Jesus is performing the Passover, that's in verse 21, and he performs burnt sacrifices on all seven days of the seven days of unleavened bread. And then in verse 25, it speaks of him performing sacrifices on the seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles. My point is, Jesus is going to recognize Passover and its protocols, even throughout his millennial reign. So why can't we do the same? Obviously, we're not supposed to perform burnt sacrifices. But by recognizing Jesus as the Lamb of God that was slain, that was offered to God in our stead, then we are in Passover and we observe Passover forever. How much more powerful will that observation be if we somehow apply the days, the weeks, the months, the hours, the protocols to the level that we can and apply them with Christ Jesus as that Lamb. There's no reason we cannot observe Passover on the full moon of the 14th of Nisan. There's no reason we cannot acknowledge the days that are involved, such as the 10th of Nisan when you choose the Lamb, and the High Sabbath, which is the 15th, or staying up after sunset with friends and family to have a Passover fellowship. By doing so, people would see a strong witness, and the people partaking in this would see the authenticity of Scripture and the supreme sacrifice Jesus made as our Lamb sacrifice. Now, some theologians will try to convince people that the Last Supper was that second Passover that the Bible talks about. It is not. The second Passover is a Passover that was established for those who missed the first Passover because they were on a journey or because they were Levitically defiled somehow. They touched something dead or they touched some blood or whatever the case may be. The second Passover is a month later and it is also observed on the 14th, 15th of that month. And the 14th and 15th of both those months is a full moon. That's important. God uses the moon as a calendar. There's no doubt in anybody's mind when that moon is in its full glory up in the sky that they are on the 15th of the month. So again, the sacrifice is made on the 14th day of that month towards the end of that day. That would be the evening of that day. And they would partake of it after the sun went down and they would follow the same protocol as the people of Israel did the month before. You'll see in 2 Chronicles chapter 30 verses 1 through 3 that Hezekiah sent letters out to the northern tribes that they would come down and partake of the second Passover with them. So there they actually tried to perform that Passover ritual and unfortunately I believe they were denied. Now one last note, notice I keep calling it a Passover ritual. The Passover is nowhere close to being a supper or a meal. It's a ritual. There's only a handful of items and most of them don't taste very good. The bitter herbs would be like taking a mouthful of horseradish or garlic. It's supposed to, again, invoke an emotion, a reaction. It's not pleasant. It's something very not pleasant. The whole slaughter of the lamb, offering of the lamb, and the partaking of the lamb is supposed to be a horrific event, not a celebration. It represents God losing the most important thing to him, which was his only begotten son, his son who was totally innocent. It would be on the same level of you taking your neighbor's child who is younger than a year and s sacrificing the child. That would be horrific. And yet mankind has done this throughout the years when they sacrificed their children to Moloch and other things. What a horrific event. God did not want mankind sacrificing their own children. He offered his own and offered it once so that this offering could be kept at a minimum, which was one man. And then by faith, everybody can enter into this offering and fulfill that blood covenant restoration through that one man. Because of one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. We now have one man who has erased that curse by becoming the sacrifice through his own free will. And he made that decision as an adult. God did not take a child. 
he took a man. And that man was Yahshua Messiah, Jesus Christ. And Jesus performed the ultimate sacrifice because he loved his father and because he loved his bride. So now let's look at the New Testament where it involved Jesus fulfilling all these protocols. Again, look at the timeline, which is at the top of your screen. The first of that month is a new moon, that little sliver. On the tenth day of that month, that is when the Lamb was chosen. Between the fourteenth and the fifteenth of that month, there is a full moon. And on the waning part of the fourteenth, that is when the Lamb is sacrificed and offered to God. Beginning on the fifteenth into the night, that is when the Lamb is consumed or partaken of. Look at John 19, 30-31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, that would be the high Sabbath, in fact, it even says in the narrative, for that Sabbath day was the high Sabbath day, they besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. This is the reason that in the Old Testament Passover protocol, you were not to break the bones of the lamb, because it represented a prophetic and a type of Christ not having his legs broken on the cross. This is violated today during the Passover ritual that many Hebrews and many believers practice when they take a lamb shank that has been cut. And who knows when that Paschal lamb was butchered or sacrificed? It certainly was not offered to God because there's no temple and no priests to perform the Passover preparation sacrifice protocol. The lamb has to be sacrificed on the 14th of Nisan, the day of preparation. Modern Paschal lamb dinners are most probably butchered way in advance, and it probably is not a lamb younger than one year of age. And as I have mentioned, the shanks are often broken. That is, the bones of the shanks are often broken or sawed, so they fit in the packaging. That is also a violation of Passover protocol. Well, there's only one day that you can sacrifice the lamb, and that's on the 14th. You can't do it a month earlier, or a week earlier, or a day earlier. It's got to be done on the 14th. And what John 19 is saying is that Jesus was on the cross, and he died on the cross on the day of preparation. The day of preparation is the 14th day of Abib or Nisan. The day of preparation is when the lamb is sacrificed and offered to God. This information is again repeated in John 19, 40-42. Then they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths. Verse 42 says, There laid they Jesus therefore because of the Jewish preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. What it's saying is, they had to prepare Jesus for burial immediately because it was the Jews' preparation day, and what followed that was Sabbath, and you can do no work on Sabbath. Jesus had to be in the tomb before the high Sabbath began. The day of preparation is the 14th, the high Sabbath is the 15th. So Jesus was on the cross from the third hour of the Hebrew day to the ninth hour of the Hebrew day. That's six Hebrew hours. And at the sixth hour, it is said that darkness came over all the land. It says that in Matthew and in Mark, in Luke, it says that darkness came over all the earth. I make mention of that because some people attempt to teach that this was caused by a solar eclipse. Well, the Passover happens during a full moon. You cannot have a solar eclipse during a full moon. You can only have a lunar eclipse, which was probably the case, which turned the moon to blood for a couple hours that night. But you cannot have a solar eclipse a solar eclipse does not last for three hours. So the darkness coming over the entire earth for those three hours was a supernatural event caused by the hand of God. Interesting enough, it happened right when the priests of the temple were attempting to sacrifice the lambs. Well, the Lamb of God was on the cross being sacrificed. So these priests really couldn't see what they were doing. And I'm wondering how many lambs were sacrificed. God was sending them a message. There was to be only one lamb sacrificed that day. Continuing, we see in Matthew 27, 57 through 62, again, this is pointing to the fact that Jesus was sacrificed and crucified on the day of preparation, and that day of preparation is the 14th of Nisan. When the even was come, and that means evening, when the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, and he went to Pilate and he begged for Jesus' body. And they laid Jesus in the tomb. Verse 62 says, Now the next day, that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests went on to Pilate. 
Joseph went to Pilate towards the end of the 14th day of Nisan to beg the body of Jesus. That was the day of preparation. I'm going to keep hammering this home because the key to resolving all this is finding out when that preparation was. John 19, verses 13 through 14. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. Now this particular sixth hour, there's some controversy because that would be noon if it was a Hebrew sixth hour. Many scholars believe this was a Roman sixth hour. In other words, Jesus was before Pilate right around sunrise, which is the sixth hour of the Roman clock. But he was on the cross on the sixth hour of the Hebrew clock, or the Hebrew means of reckoning the hours of the day. Mark 15, 42-43. And now when the even was come, or the evening, because it was the preparation, there it is again, that is the day before the Sabbath, that would be the high Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea went on to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Luke 23, 50-56. There is a man named Joseph. He was of Arimathea. He begged the body of Jesus. And that day was the day of preparation. And the Sabbath, that would be the high Sabbath, which is the first day of the seven days of unleavened bread, that would be the 15th of Nisan, the high Sabbath. And the high Sabbath drew on. And the women also... And they rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. These are the women that went to anoint Jesus for burial on the third day after which Jesus arose. They did not go on the high Sabbath. And the following day was the weekly Sabbath. So the 15th and the 16th of Nisan were Sabbaths. The first was the high Sabbath. The second was the weekly Sabbath. So the women arrived at the tomb on the 17th of Nisan. And that's a fulfillment of scripture. Jesus said he would rise on the third day. Well, the third day of what? The third day of unleavened bread. Everybody knew what he meant when he said the third day. It's a third day of something important. And that something important at that time of the year was the seven days of unleavened bread. So the third day of unleavened bread is the 17th. The woman could not anoint the body on the 15th because it was a high Sabbath. They could not do it on the 16th because it was a regular Sabbath. They came on the third day of unleavened bread, which was the 17th. That's when Jesus rose. They got there and he's already gone. And to add to that information, the high priests went to Pilate and asked for these Roman centurions to set a seal on the tomb and to stand guard so nobody could steal the body and make up a story that Jesus rose. These Roman centurions, they were vicious. And anybody getting even close to that tomb would have been terminated. Nobody showed up to the tomb until the third day. But the women got there a little bit earlier, and God made it so that that was not a problem. He got rid of the centurions. They went running for fear. Something to do with a big angel or something. Regardless, Jesus was crucified on the day of preparation, and he was buried before sunset. Because sunset would begin the high Sabbath, and everything had to be cleaned up, or the Passover would have been defiled. That's why they crucified Jesus before the feast started. They even said, we have to do this before the feast or the entire city is going to be in uproar because we're defiling this Passover by conducting a crucifixion. They had to kill Jesus before the 15th of Nisan. 1 Corinthians 5.17, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Now with these verses and verses I'm going to share with you in a little bit, you're going to see that Jesus fulfilled everything to the very day, hour, and minute, and second he fulfilled these things. He completed these things. That means something, because if he had a Passover ritual on the 13th of Nisan, that means he violated everything. He wasn't following the protocol. This is just more evidence to support the theory that the Last Supper was not a Passover ritual. Was it an atonement ritual? Yes, atonement is all through that, but it's also something greater. It's a betrothal ritual. It's a betrothal protocol. And if we were more educated of what a Hebrew betrothal protocol consists of, we could see it clearly. Now many may ask, why is it even important to challenge this long-held tradition that the Last Supper was a Passover ritual? Well, obviously, if they got it wrong, then we are following wrong tradition. In addition, if they got it wrong, we need to know who it was that got it wrong so we can be aware that there are discrepancies in our traditions. 
And if that's the case, could it be possible that we are being distracted from what God is really trying to show us in the Last Supper? Yes, the Last Supper had blood atonement, salvation elements to it. Jesus said that the wine represented his blood that was to be shed for the remission of sins. So yes, there's an element there of salvation, of atonement, of Passover, so to speak. But the Passover didn't take place until the next day from the Last Supper. And Jesus was that Passover. He was the blood sacrifice. But if the translations have it wrong, then we need to know that because that will alert us to the possibilities that they have other things wrong when trying to interpret and translate God's Word. God's Word has to line up with His patterns, with His plans, with what He wrote in the Old Testament because Jesus said, I have come to fulfill the law, not to do away with it. Jesus came and fulfilled the Passover, but the Last Supper was not a Passover. It was something greater. I contend that it was a betrothal ceremony, a betrothal event, and I also contend that it is one of the most important ceremonies that a Christian can observe. And there's no better way to show you that the Last Supper was not a Passover ritual than to show you how and when the Paschal Lamb was sacrificed and offered to God and who was involved in that sacrifice and offering. Mind you, they did not partake of lamb at the Passover ritual. Rather, they partook of lamb that had been sacrificed and offered to God. You don't just go out and buy lamb someplace at the farmer's market or wherever they sell meats back there in Jerusalem. You can eat lamb 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. But you can only partake of lamb offered to God after it's been sacrificed once a year. And that's on the 14th of Nisan is when they offer it. And you partake of it the first 12 hours, 6 to 12 hours, of the 15th Nisan, that's after the sun sets on the 14th, beginning the 15th, so that at midnight the angel of death would pass over those dwellings that had lamb's blood applied to their doorposts. That's why it's called pass over, because the angel of death would pass over. But that lamb was only sacrificed on the 14th of Nisan. So let me examine how this offering took place. Number one, and I'm going to hammer this again and again and again. If you don't hear this a hundred times during this presentation, go back and hear it again so you do hear it a hundred times. The 14th of Nisan is when they sacrificed the lamb and offered it to God. This is called the day of preparation. And it was done with a lamb that was a year old or younger. That brings out innocence. Our sins destroyed innocence. It's supposed to do something to our heart. It's supposed to do something to our emotions. It's supposed to get us to self-examine because of how horrific our sins affects something else. In this case, it destroys, it kills, it murders innocence. It's supposed to get us to go before God and repent and cry out to Him to change our hearts so we don't do things like that. Number two, this lamb is to be observed for four days. Not three days, not two days, four days. And they observe that lamb for four days to see if there's any blemish. Jesus was observed by the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests, the people of Jerusalem for four days. And Pilate said, I find no fault in him. He was found without blemish. And then he became the sacrificial lamb whose blood atones for our sins. But that was on the 14th of Nisan. The Last Supper was on the day before the 13th of Nisan. Number three, this Paschal lamb is sacrificed in the evening of the 14th, and that starts on the sixth hour of the day. And here I have highlighted it over on the right-hand side of this diagram. This is when the lamb is sacrificed to God, and the blood of this lamb is poured out at the base of the altar. Number four, the offering of the Paschal lamb is conducted in the outer court of the temple. It's not done in the backyard, it's not done in a back room, it's not done in someone else's house. It's done in the courtyard. This is the only day of the year where an average person can actually walk into the outer court, and it's the only sacrifice conducted in the temple where an ordinary person is part of the ceremony. Number five, it's conducted by either the head of the household and or his representative, somebody who represents an entire family. 
they take this lamb, they bring it into the court, and it's done in three waves because there's so many pilgrims coming into Jerusalem and so many pilgrims that have a lamb to be sacrificed that they had to do it in three stages. There are three groups of people. Number six, assisting in that sacrifice are hundreds of priests who line themselves up in rows throughout this courtyard, and they are there with that head of the household, slaying the lamb, draining its blood, and dressing out this little lamb. And they collect the blood in silver or gold cups, and they pass this down the row of priests to the altar, and then the blood is poured at the base of the altar. So in short, what I'm trying to say is that the sacrifice and the offering of the Paschal Lamb is conducted in the courtyard by priests and by the head of the households. It's only done on the 14th. It is not done on any other day of the year, with the exception of a month later for those who missed the first Passover. It is not done on the 13th, it's not done on the 12th, it's not done on the 10th in the sun. On those days, the outer court is off limits to everyone except the priests. There is no sacrificing of lambs on any other day. So once this lamb is sacrificed on the evening of the 14th, then it's handed back to the head of the household or his representative, and they take it back to their dwelling area, and within a block or two of their dwelling area, they have barbecues or ovens set up where they roast the lamb. So the sun is still in the sky, it's still light out, they're roasting the lamb. Once the lamb is roasted, they take it back to the dwelling place, and after the sun sets, then they partake of this lamb. Not any lamb, but a lamb that has been sacrificed and offered to God. Along with the lamb is the unleavened bread, which was probably prepared earlier that day on the 14th in the sun, and also they partake of bitter herbs. Number nine, this ritual is partaken of by a family group called a band. And sometimes this is done with multiple bands gathered together in the same dwelling. And they would remain there until morning. Now this is one more thing to consider. The Passover ritual of partaking of the sacrificed lamb, the bitter herbs, and the unleavened bread is supposed to be celebrated with your family. That's what the word band means. It's the family unit. This would include mothers, fathers, daughters, sons, sometimes relatives. So, if the Last Supper was a Passover ritual, where was Mary? Where was Mary the mother of Jesus? She was in the area, obviously, because she was there during the crucifixion the next day. Where was Mary Magdalene and the other women that later went to Jesus' tomb to anoint him after he was buried? I would think that some of these women were relatives, if not siblings, of some of the disciples that were at the Last Supper. They too should have been included if it was a Passover ritual. Jesus had half-brothers and half-sisters. Were they in Jerusalem during this Passover? They were supposed to be. Now this doesn't necessarily prove anything, but it sure supports the notion that the Last Supper was not a Passover ritual, else these other people would have been included in this social setting. Number 10, if any of this lamb remained in the morning, when the sun started coming up, they would take it and burn it. Along with that, you must remember they did not break any of the bones. We mentioned that earlier in this presentation. And number 11, I've mentioned this before, this is only done once a year with the exception of the second Passover, which is conducted a month later for those who missed the first Passover. So technically it's only done once a year. Whereas Jesus, on the day of his resurrection, performed the Last Supper ceremony again with the disciples he met with on the road to Emmaus. He took bread, broke it, gave it to them, and then he disappeared. Jesus instructed us to perform the Last Supper protocol every time we gather in his name. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. So if that happens, and it happens once a week, once a month, three times a year, five times a year, it cannot be a Passover ritual because the Passover ritual is only conducted once a year. So by looking at these 11 points that are on the screen before you, it is literally impossible for Jesus and his disciples to have had lamb sacrificed and offered to God at the Last Supper. Did not happen. Could not have been sacrificed, could not have been there, and that's why you don't find it in the narrative of those passages and scriptures that deal with the Last Supper. Again, the Last Supper was on the 13th of Nisan. They partook of the Last Supper 
before sunset. The Passover ritual was about 24 hours later, and that was to be partaken of after sunset. So let me throw up a picture in front of you so you can get a better idea of what this looks like. What you see here are rows of priests. They're the ones in white. Rows of priests with these goblets or cups in their hand. One row will have golden cups. One row will have silver cups. Dispersed between them are the average Hebrew head of the household who brought the lamb in into the courtyard so that lamb could be slain and then the blood offered to God. And you see in the background there, you see the altar ablaze awaiting these offerings. Let me read to you what I have at the top of the screen here. It says, each group of pilgrims, and Jesus and his disciples were pilgrims, they did not reside in Jerusalem for the year. Jesus came from out of town, so he was a pilgrim. Each group of pilgrims sent one or two representatives to the temple to bring its pre-designated sheep as the Passover offering. Once the congregation arrived in the courtyard, the gates were closed and the service was conducted to the sound of the Levites' trumpet blast. The entire assembly sang the Hallel prayers, and the Hallel prayers are Psalms 113 through 118, and the entire assembly sang the Hallel prayer of thanksgiving together, led by the Levite choir. Those standing in the courtyard saw row upon row of priests who held the special silver and gold vessels called Mizrak. The Mizrak was used for gathering the blood of the offering. One row handled golden vessels exclusively, and one row silver. The priest standing closest to the altar receives this Mizrak. They receive the vessel and pour the contents on the foundation of the altar. So there you see in the lower left-hand corner what a Mizrak looks like. And you can see in the background, up against the altar, priests pouring the blood at the base of the altar. This ceremony is only performed on the 14th of Nisan. From the beginning of the evening, which is the sixth hour, usually up until about the ninth hour. So it's about a three, four hour event. And they had to process thousands upon thousands of pilgrims with their sheep. So this was done in three large groups. Mind you, this was not done on the 13th of Nisan. The Last Supper was on the 13th of Nisan. This ceremony that you see in front of you is only performed on the 14th. So the only conclusion one can come to is that there was no lamb available to be partaken of at the Last Supper. It didn't exist yet. The lamb had only been observed for three days, not four. The entire outer court was not set up with priests and the Mizrak and the altar going full force to receive the blood of these animals. No one was even allowed in the outer court other than priests performing their daily priestly duties. There was no preparation day rituals being performed on the 13th of Nisan. And I would assume anybody trying to sneak in there to sacrifice a lamb so they could have it for the Last Supper would have been caught and arrested and probably stoned or violating Passover protocols and temple protocols. Certainly you could not get any priests together to sacrifice something for Jesus on the 13th so they could have a Paschal lamb to partake of on the Last Supper. Most of these priests were trying to kill Jesus. They weren't going to cater to him. They certainly weren't going to violate Passover on his behalf. So again, I emphasize, there was no lamb that had been sacrificed and offered to God present at the Last Supper, and that is one of the three elements that is required for a Passover ritual, which is unleavened bread, which is most probably prepared earlier on the 14th, bitter herbs, and the Paschal lamb, and that is a lamb that has been sacrificed and offered to God. Not just any lamb. It had to be a sacrificial lamb. So hopefully I have demonstrated to you that Jesus was on the cross on the 14th day of Nisan, that being the day of preparation. That being the case, the Last Supper, which occurred about 24 hours earlier, would have taken place on the 13th of Nisan. So let's look at the Last Supper. Mark 14, 17, which equates with Matthew 26, 20, and Luke 22, 14. Mark 14, 17 says, And in the evening Jesus cometh with the twelve. This is speaking of Jesus and his disciples gathering for the Last Supper. 
The word evening there, I have already discussed with you. Evening would be from high noon, that would be a Hebrew noon, when the sun is in its highest position in the heavens, till sunset. So sometime after high noon, Jesus and his disciples gathered for that last supper. John 13, 1 through 2 says, Now before the feast of Passover, and that word Passover is Pascha, which means the meal or the festival and or the specific sacrifices connected with it. And I continue, When Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out, and the supper being ended, verse 2, the devil having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Add to that John 13, 29 through 30. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said to him, Buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went out immediately, and it was night. The point here is, the supper ended before the night, and there were still activities that were required for the preparation of Passover, because the other disciples thought that Judas was going out to conduct that business and purchase things for the feast. This means that the Last Supper was not the Passover feast that they thought Judas was purchasing things for. Now remember, the Passover ritual, or the Passover feast, where you partake of the lamb sacrificed and offered to God with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, that is consumed after the sun sets. That is consumed at night. We see here that the Last Supper ended before nightfall. And need I remind you, this was on the 13th of Nisan, not the 14th of Nisan, into the 15th. Thus, the Last Supper was not a Passover ritual. So what I have done with this slide and the last couple slides is demonstrate to you, both by scripture, which you see now before you, and by examining the literal sacrifice and offering of the Lamb to God in the temple on the 14th of Nisan, that both scripture and the sacrificial protocols demonstrate clearly that it was impossible for there to be Lamb that was sacrificed to God and offered to God involved in the Last Supper. And this only makes sense when we realize that Jesus was that Paschal offering to God. In fact, it can be argued that there was no lambs sacrificed and offered to God on that specific Passover because God made the whole earth dark for those hours when those lambs were supposed to be sacrificed. This means that there was only one lamb that was sacrificed, and that was Jesus. And that was the only offering that God was going to accept on this Passover. And look one more time at John 13, verses 1 through 2. If the supper was ended before the Feast of Passover, then how can the Last Supper be the same event as the Passover? It cannot. When we look at Matthew 26, verse 26, along with Mark 14, 22, and Luke 22, 19, we see that Jesus took bread and blessed it. The Greek word for bread used in these three verses is the word artos, and it means a loaf or raised bread. This is leavened bread, and leavened bread is not used in a Passover ceremony. Now, there are those that teach that this word bread here is a generic term used for any type of bread, and that it can also be used as a replacement for the word unleavened, that is to say unleavened bread. However, there is a very specific Greek word used in the New Testament which means unleavened bread starting with Luke 22 verses 1 and 7, and I've listed about another half dozen right after that. The Greek word there is azumos, and that word is only used in the New Testament when speaking of unleavened bread or the feast of the seven days of unleavened bread. Now, since unleavened bread is critical to the Passover Seder, one would think that God's Spirit would use that Greek word meant for unleavened bread in those specific passages and not use a generic term, which is almost always used for leavened bread. And one other point of interest, it is thought that the unleavened bread used in the yearly Passover Seder is actually prepared on the morning of the 14th of Nisan, so it's available along with the bitter herbs and along with the lamb that was sacrificed and offered to God in the temple later that day after the sun sets, which begins the 15th of Nisan, which is the first day of the seven days of unleavened bread. Not that you cannot prepare or make unleavened bread any day of the year. If there were special protocols in place to make this unleavened bread on the morning of the 14th, 
then that's one more element that was missing at the Last Supper, which was conducted on the afternoon of the 13th of Nisan. These may all seem like insignificant technicalities, but they were not insignificant to the Jewish people and the Jewish culture. It's just that this circumstantial evidence continues to multiply, strongly supporting that the Last Supper was not a Passover Seder. Again, I contend that it was something greater, which we will see here shortly. Now, one last thing you should probably consider, which is found in Exodus 12, verse 22, is that associated with the Passover ritual is the fact that you're not supposed to leave the dwelling place until morning. Jesus and his disciples left the room that they were in, where they partook of the Last Supper, and went to the Garden of Gethsemane. In other words, they were out of their dwelling place during the night. Now consider the fact that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the priests were trying to kill Jesus for any reason. What better reason would there be if Jesus violated Passover? Certainly they would have used that against him at his trial and would have pinned that over his head on the plaque during his crucifixion. They didn't because they too were out in the dark of night. In addition to holding an illegal trial against Jesus during the night, and it is recorded in John 18:28 that the leaders that were conducting this illegal trial against Jesus did not want to go into the hall of judgment to bring Jesus to Caiaphas, lest they should be defiled, which would prevent them from eating the Passover. This, of course, means the Passover had not taken place yet because these Jewish leaders were concerned about being defiled, which would prevent them from partaking of the Passover. Now we're almost to the good stuff. The good stuff being the betrothal ceremony and betrothal protocols that are manifest in the Last Supper. I'll keep repeating that the Last Supper did have blood atonement and salvation parts to it, very much so in fact. However, it was not the Passover feast or convocation that was established by God through Moses. Rather, it was a ceremony and a ritual that Jesus instigated. And if you really understand the Last Supper, you'll come to realize that it incorporates all of the feasts because it summarizes the end result of what all the feasts stand for and are meant for. And they are meant for Jesus to find his bride. The payment for the bride, or as it could be said, the dowry for the bride that the bridegroom pays, was paid on the cross by Jesus. That's Passover. The gifts and the oil that the bride receives and the bride needs in preparation for the marriage is provided through the Feast of Pentecost. The marriage of the king or the marriage of the lamb takes place at the Feast of Trumpets. And finally, the millennial reign of the lamb with his bride is represented by the Feast of Tabernacles. But in order for you to start to see these things, certain mindsets and certain traditions have to be eradicated. Jesus said the word of God is made of none effect because of traditions. And I'm about to show you that much of the historic Christian church and the translators of the Bible configured their doctrines and mindset according to their traditions, as opposed to defining their traditions as the result of a proper understanding of God's feasts, God's patterns, and God's word. You're about to see some very blatant mistranslations of the word causing New Testament passages to contradict the Old Testament and to contradict other passages in the New Testament. This is all because the translators are translating backwards. They are translating the word according to their traditions rather than translating their traditions based upon the Old Testament writings. So what I've done here is I've put up a chart of the four Gospels and arranged scriptures according to the days of the month leading up to Passover. We'll start again with the day of preparation, the 14th of Abib or Nisan, whichever rendering you choose, and we will walk back each day so you can see that Jesus fulfilled each aspect of the preparation leading up to Passover. But first I'm going to throw up some Old Testament scriptures defining the day of preparation and defining the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This would be the 14th of Abib or Nisan and the 15th of Abib or Nisan respectively. You can see the scriptures here at the left side of your screen. I recommend you go and look up each and every one. They specifically identify the day of the month that this takes place. 
And this is what Jesus fulfilled. So we'll start with Matthew 27, verses 59 through 66. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen. Now the next day that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate. What this verse points out is that Jesus was on the cross on the 14th of Nisan. That is the day of preparation. It should be very evident by now that the Last Supper was the day that preceded the day of preparation, that being the 13th of Nisan. Look at that, Matthew 26, 2 through 21. More specifically, verse 17, it says, Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where will we go to prepare for Passover? Now the first day of unleavened bread is not the 13th of Nisan. The first day of the seven days of unleavened bread is the 15th. And when you go into the Greek and look at the Greek manuscripts, it literally reads, or the translation should literally read, Now before the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? I find it fascinating that a few changed prepositions, or a few different words, can render a meaning totally different. Regardless, the translators got it completely wrong. And this demonstrates to me that they are disconnected from God's patterns, God's feasts, and God's plans. As for me and my house, I want to know God's plans so I can prepare myself and walk therein. Now look at the Gospel of Mark. Mark 15, verses 42 to 43. And now when the evening was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, that's the high Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. This verse again proves that Jesus was on the cross of the 14th of Nisan, which is the day of preparation, which I keep preaching. Now look at Mark 14, 1 through 16, more specifically verse 12. And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, that's Jesus, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare, that thou mayest eat the Passover? Well, first of all, they didn't kill the Passover on the 13th of Nisan. They did it on the 14th of Nisan. And they didn't kill the Passover on the first day of unleavened bread. They partook of the sacrificed lamb on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the 15th of Nisan. The translators here really muffed it up. They missed the entire understanding how the timeline of Passover unfolds. They got it completely wrong. So did the Gospel of Luke. Look at Luke 23, verses 50 through 56. More specifically, we'll start with verse 50. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, that's Joseph of Arimathea. This man went on the Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And that day was the preparation, and the high Sabbath drew on. Again, this verse proves that Jesus was on the cross on the 14th of Nisan, the day of preparation. I told you you're going to be hearing this day of preparation thing a hundred times, maybe 200 now. But you need to understand it. It needs to be drilled into your understanding. It needs to be solid. Now look at the day before. Luke 22, verses 7 through 8. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. Well, again, the Passover is not killed on the first day, or any day, of the seven days of unleavened bread. The Greek is literally, Then approached the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. This does not mean the Passover is killed on unleavened bread. What it means is there's a part of this entire holiday season where there's the day of preparation and that is followed by the seven days of unleavened bread. But this all comes into focus when we jump down to John, verses 19, 14 to 42. Verse 14 says, And it was the preparation of the Passover, about the sixth hour. And here Jesus is before Pilate. And later in the passage, verse 31, The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, that would be the high Sabbath. In fact, it even says it there, for that Sabbath day was an high Sabbath. They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken. Again, this is demonstrating and proving that Jesus was on the cross on the 14th of Nisan, which is the day of preparation. That is the day that the Lamb is slaughtered and then offered to God. And that's what Jesus was, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And in defining the Last Supper in the Gospel of John, 
We find that in John 13, verses 1 through 2. Now before the Feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, and supper being ended. I already read these verses to you. But the Gospel of John, in its current translation, is correct. And that is that it expresses that the Last Supper was concluded before the Feast of Passover was observed. It should be clear that the translations of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John contradict each other and they contradict the Old Testament scriptures. That is because the translators translated the Greek according to the church traditions and the church mindset, and the church traditions and the church mindset is disconnected from God's patterns, God's feasts, God's convocations, and God's plans. When we turn around and translate the timeline of each of the four Gospels in accordance to God's plans and God's patterns, They all line up. They all make sense. Now, if you want to be at the mercy of people who translate incorrectly, that is your choice. I would not recommend that to anyone. God established these feasts for his people because it describes his game plan and his timelines that he's going to follow. We have to go back and translate everything according to his feasts and plans. So allow me to go over the 13th of Nisan one more time, and I'll expand the font so you can more clearly see how the Greek should be translated. And then you can compare it to the scriptures over on the left-hand side, speaking of the day of preparation being the 14th of Abib Nisan, and the first day of unleavened bread being the 15th of Abib Nisan. So first, Matthew 26, verses 2 through 21, starting verse 17. It should read, Now before the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where do we go to prepare for Passover? Mind you, to prepare for Passover takes a couple days. Many of you probably know that they have to go through their dwelling place and get rid of all the leaven. That takes a little bit of time. There are also washings, ceremonial washings, that the people perform on themselves. They're called the mikvah. And most of these are supposed to be pools of running or living water that wash over you. Jesus actually performed this with the foot washing, and we'll see that later. Mark 14, starting in verse 12. It should read something to the effect, And before the day of unleavened bread when they kill the Passover. Well, they kill the Passover on the 14th and Nisan. So if it's before that day, then obviously that would be the 13th and Nisan when the Last Supper is recorded in Mark 14. Luke 22, verse 7, then approached the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. That is exactly how the Greek reads. Unfortunately, the translators ended up kind of tweaking it to a different outcome. And as I mentioned earlier, John chapter 13 got it pretty much correct. The supper had ended before the feast of the Passover. Now, many people may think that this is no big deal. But I liken it to foreigners coming from a different country wanting to acclimate into the American society. And by doing so, they decide to honor and observe Independence Day. But because they did not grow up in this society, they are somewhat ignorant as to the social norms associated with Independence Day. So let's say they decided to get together and have a big picnic on the 2nd of July and claim that that is their celebration of Independence Day. And instead of serving hot dogs, apple pie, and watching baseball on that day, they instead incorporate their own cuisine that they're familiar with and participate in some sport that we know not of. Their hearts might be right, but they got the whole thing wrong. Likewise, we are so disconnected from the patterns and the feasts and the convocations of God that we have totally messed this thing up. Our hearts may be right, and we may have bits and parts of it correct, but we're far from being in focus with what God established in these patterns. We need to correct that, bring these things back into focus according to God's patterns as were established, ordained, and described in the Old Testament, and then we'll see how Jesus fulfilled these things, and we'll see the exact nature of the Last Supper and what it was meant to be. Now let's look at the 12th of Nisan. The verse in Matthew that best describes the timeline associated with the Last Supper and Passover would be Matthew 26, verses 2 through 5. 
Jesus said, You will know that after two days is the Feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Now the leaders of Jerusalem did not want to crucify or kill anyone on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And I assume that would mean any of the seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because it would cause the people to riot. But again, the translators added words to this scripture. They added the word day. The word day there, you can see it's crossed out, is not in the Greek. It should read, but they said, not on the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. So they were determined to crucify Christ before the 15th of Nisan. The 15th of Nisan being the first day of the seven days of unleavened bread. Mark 14 verses 1 and 2 basically say the same thing. After two days was the feast of Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. Again, the translators added the word day in verse 2, but it doesn't belong there. It should read, but they said, not on the feast, and that's referring to the seven days of unleavened bread, not on the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. Luke chapter 22, verses 1 and 2 confirm this. It reads, now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. In this passage, Luke speaks to the entire seven days of unleavened bread, calling it the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And if you follow along on the chart horizontally, you will find that the timeline indeed does follow a sequential order. Matthew 21, 9 through 15, we will soon see, is the 10th of Nisan. Two days later, you have Matthew 26, verses 2 through 5, and the next day, which was the day of the Last Supper, that is expressed by Matthew 26, verses 17 and on. You will find the same timeline in Mark, somewhat in Luke, though we're missing the 10th and the Son in Luke, but it's very pronounced in the book of John. In fact, with the book of John, we actually start on the 9th day of Nisan. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. Verse 1 says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, he came to Bethany. Well, if the Passover is on the 15th, and you subtract six days, then Jesus went to Bethany on the ninth of Nisan. Verse 3 says, Then took Mary, this is not Mary the mother of Jesus, but some believe it to be Mary Magdalene, then took Mary a pound of spikenard and anointed the feet of Jesus. On the next day, what's the next day from the ninth of Nisan? That would be the tenth. So on the tenth of Nisan, or Abib, however you want to call that month, there were much people that came to the feast, and Jesus, when he found a young ass, sat thereon. So according to the Old Testament, what happens on the 10th of Nisan? That is when you choose the lamb, and you watch the lamb for four days. Jesus came into Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan, probably around noon, or maybe a little earlier, and he taught in the temple for three days, and then he was arrested, and he was observed at his trials, including the trials before Pilate and Caiaphas and Herod and the people. So Jesus was actually examined for four days, just like the sacrificial Paschal lamb is to be watched for four days. And Jesus was found without blemish. Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. Thus Jesus fulfilled the entire Passover sequence or Passover timeline in the preparation of the lamb for sacrifice and offering to God. In fact, when he rode into Jerusalem to the temple on the young ass, that is the exact same time when the high priest had gone out of the outer wall of Jerusalem, chosen the lamb, and was bringing it back into the city of Jerusalem to be taken to the temple. It's just that Jesus got there first. So in rode the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, and they observed him that is Jesus, they observed him for four days, and then they crucified him on that fourth day, which is the 14th of the sun, the day of preparation. So you can read the rest of this here in Mark, and again, uh, John chapters 12, and John chapter 12, 1 through 14. That is the 10th day of Nisan. So when Jesus freely offered himself as a sacrifice to God, he fulfilled Passover. All the thousands of Passovers that predated his crucifixion all pointed to what he would do and what he did. And by doing so, Jesus provided a better testament than what was previously available. 
Hebrews 7 verse 27 says, For this he did once, when he offered up himself. 1 Corinthians 5 7 states that, For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Ephesians 5 2, As Christ also hath loved us, he hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. 1 Peter 1 19, Jesus is the Lamb without blemish. 1 John 1 29, John the Baptist recognized Jesus as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. I believe this is why Jesus was emphasized as the only one worthy to open the seals of God in the book of Revelation. No other man in the history of mankind was found to be worthy as Jesus is. And by his sacrifice, he is our Redeemer and Messiah. But you already know that, and the purpose of this presentation is to show you the deeper meaning of the Last Supper. I believe that the facts that have been set before you prove conclusively that it was not a Passover ritual. Now we will provide you the facts that demonstrate that it was something greater. It was a betrothal ritual. Basically, it's Jesus proposing to his church and to his believers, asking them and asking us if we would betroth ourselves to him. So what was done at the Last Supper that would lead us to believe that it was a betrothal ceremony? Well, there are a number of things, but the primary object that we can focus on is the cup. But in order to do that, we have to realize that there are many Hebrew ceremonies that utilize a covenantal cup or a communal cup. One of those ceremonial rituals is the Passover Seder, at least in today's modern format. I recommend you get online and research today's Passover Seder. It utilizes four communal cups. In addition to that, participants of the Passover Seder also put out a cup for Elijah, and some put out a cup for Miriam. So there's actually five or six cups. However, only four of them are communal. And what I mean by communal is the one cup is filled with wine and that one cup is passed around at a certain point during the observance of this ritual. In a betrothal ceremony, there's only one cup used and it too is a communal cup. Each of these ceremonies have specific protocols. Each follow a specific format. One item of that format is not practiced until the former one is completed. There is a specific order on how things are carried out. And by looking at the order that Jesus followed when he took the cup, and he took it twice, by the way, if you follow the order in which Jesus took the cup and follow that through the Last Supper, we will come to realize that it was identical to a betrothal ceremony and far from the Paschal or Passover Seder ceremony. Now you have to investigate both to gain a foundational baseline of understanding of what the orders are for each ceremony. Otherwise you'll never see the significance or the difference between the two. And I personally believe that part of the preparation to be betrothed to the Lord is understanding some of this stuff and knowing this stuff so it has significance to us personally. So in other words, we have to own this on a personal level. And the only way you're going to own this on your personal level is for you to investigate. There's plenty of information out there over the net in books and encyclopedias. I need to forewarn you, a lot of it is inaccurate on some levels. But if you look at enough of them and investigate deeply enough, you will see the patterns come forth as God meant these formal ceremonies to be conducted. I have continually pointed out some of these points and will continue to do so. Today's Paschal or Passover Seder has been extremely perverted and turned to something different. Today it's more of a formal supper similar to like a Thanksgiving dinner. And indeed there should be Thanksgiving during the Passover Seder. However, the original design when God ordained this and had Moses and the children of Israel carry it out, was to, as it were, bring affliction on some level to the children of Israel so they would understand what their sins had caused. It caused the death of an innocent. That innocent was the Lamb of God, and that Lamb of God pointed to God's only begotten. The original passing over entailed the passing over of death. There was a lot of death involved. And we can only imagine the trauma that the children of Israel went through on that Passover night. It wasn't a time of warm and fuzzy. 
It was a time of conviction, of the rending of one's soul, of deep reflection, and I would bet they were scared out of their minds. The celebration and the deep thankfulness and gratitude towards God was to be realized the next morning in the following week during the remaining seven days of unleavened bread. It was a great and wonderful festival. But the initial passing over was designed to carry a weightiness to it, to get our hearts changed. I am strongly convinced that that element is missing from today's Passover Seder and has been turned into a Thanksgiving dinner. However, what I'm trying to draw your attention to is the format that Jesus used and the order in which the Last Supper unfolded. The format and order that Jesus used is identical to that of the Betrothal Supper. So let's take a look at a Jewish betrothal. I recommend you get online and look these things up. What I did to find these is I googled Jewish betrothal sandal. Now the reason I chose the word sandal has to do with the foot washing that Jesus conducted. Foot washing is actually part of the betrothal process observed by many Jewish people. And it is referred to as the sandal covenant. That's important because when you partake of that communal cup, you're entering into a covenant. When you're washing the feet, you're entering into a covenant. There are three covenants that are observed during the betrothal process. The fourth covenant being the marriage itself. Each one is marked with the partaking of wine from the same communal cup. That third communal cup can be replaced or augmented by the washing of feet. So that's why I googled Jewish betrothal sandal. One of the better websites that I have found that details these protocols is from the website called Pearl of Great Price. I'll be quoting some of their work. There are a couple others, but I'd recommend you find those that deal with the four cups of wine or four covenants involved in the betrothal process. Now the formal marriage covenant is called the Ketubah. And this Ketubah is a five-part document that is drafted and written up during this formal supper conducted by the two fathers the father of the bride, and the father of the bridegroom. It begins with the father of the bridegroom and the groom himself showing up at the bride's front door carrying a betrothal cup. Upon their arrival, they would knock at the door and the bride's father would normally answer, everyone knowing exactly what's going on. By opening the door, they signaled that the first major step towards this marriage was accepted. In Revelations 3.20, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens, I will come in and sup with them. This is a betrothal invitation, is what this is, that Jesus is stating in Revelation. So if the bride-to-be agrees to the betrothal process, her father will open the door. And so starts an intense discussion in the process of formalizing this ketubah, or marriage contract. The betrothal itself could last anywhere up to a year to two years. And if I could throw in a type, we're in our, say, our second year, a second thousand years that the church has been betrothed to the Lord. And I'm thinking he's about ready to come for her at any time. Now, once the fathers had completed the details of the wedding contract, they would sit down and share in a formal supper. And it is at this time that they take that cup, that betrothal cup, fill it with wine and share it communally. This is called the cup of sanctification, and it points to servanthood and it is a blood covenant. The wine represents blood. This cup was partaken of by all that were present, and it embodies the concept of being set apart for God. Now again, I bring up the issue of format and order. In the modern Passover Seder, there are four individual covenantal cups. Each one is taken at certain times or certain orders of the ceremony. In the modern Passover Seder, the first cup is taken before everything starts. In the betrothal ceremony, there is only one cup that is communal, and it is first taken during the supper. Now, during the betrothal ceremony, the second cup is taken after the supper. It's called the cup of betrothal. It's also called the salt covenant, and its focus is on friendship. This cup is consumed by the bride and the groom and the two fathers only. So only four people are partaking with this cup at this point. Again, the families are covenanting to become eternal friends with their sons and daughter and with each other. Now in the Gospel of John, we see Jesus speaking to his disciples and at this point he's calling them friends. This is part of the betrothal ceremony. 
Today's Paschal or Passover Seder, the first and second communal cup are partaken of before the supper is observed. This may seem like small, insignificant technicalities, but to the Hebrews, they were paramount. Now, during the betrothal formal ceremony, the cup was taken a third time, and this is the cup of redemption. It's called the Sandal Covenant, and it points to the bride understanding and knowing her inheritance that is provided for her in the ketubah, or the marriage contract, in case the bridegroom dies or is killed. The Sandal Covenant signifies the shared inheritance of the marriage partners. This cup is taken only by the bride and bridegroom. This cup is drunk at the end of the meal, and it seals the marriage covenant. Now we see that Jesus took the cup twice in the book of Luke. We don't know if or why Jesus did not take the cup a third time, but we do know that he did wash the disciples' feet. And the washing of the feet is known as the Sandal Covenant. And it appears that there's an implication that this ceremonial practice can be a substitute or replacement for the partaking of the third cup. I'm just guessing at this point, because I have not found anything out there that definitively reveals this. There may be something else involved with Jesus choosing the sandal covenant or the foot washing as opposed to the third cup. And this is getting Peter's reaction. When Jesus started washing feet, Peter goes, you're not washing my feet. First, let me say that the washing of feet is different than providing water in a wash bin when people come off a long journey where they've been walking for a long time. Some ministers and teachers get this confused. When pilgrims show up after walking a long journey and they show up at your front door, it's customary and courteous to let them freshen up. So you provide them with a bowl of water and towels or whatever, but you're not washing their feet. They're washing their own feet. The thing that Jesus did was a covenantal observance, and he performed it after the supper, not before the supper when they first arrived. The two are different. The two are very different. One is a courtesy. One is a covenant. Jesus washing the feet of the disciples was a covenantal observance. And when he got to Peter, Peter kind of balked at it. At this point, I don't think Peter really knew what was going on, but he shortly there caught on. Because Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, if I don't bring you into this covenant, you're not going to have inheritance. That's what is meant by, you will not have part of me. Jesus was saying, you will not partake of the inheritance. So Peter, being Peter, said, then wash all of me. And Peter kind of brought it into the context of it being a mikvah. A mikvah is a purification process that the bride uses to prepare herself for her wedding day. It's also practiced by everyone in anticipation for the formal feasts. The mikvah was normally a pool of running water. So this living water, as running water is often called, washes over you, which religiously or ceremonially purifies you. And then note Jesus' response to Peter. Jesus said, you are clean. There's no need to wash all of you. What I have done has cleansed you. So what I'm saying here is that Jesus was referring to a purification process, a spiritual and ceremonial purification process. He wasn't talking about foot hygiene. Then there are a couple other things that Jesus stated that pulls this even tighter into the context of a betrothal ceremony or betrothal protocol. He said, I go to my father to prepare a place for you. Those words are only understood and applied in a betrothal process. At this point, the bride and bridegroom are now man and wife legally. It's just that they have to wait until the marriage itself before they can consummate the marriage and live together. And at the end of this ketubah, the groom leaves with his father and goes and prepares a place or an attachment onto the father's house. And when that is completed and when he has saved up enough money, he comes back and takes his bride. And one other statement that Jesus made is that he said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Well, that's his second coming, and he's coming again for his bride. So that's the fourth cup. The fourth cup is at the wedding, when the bride and the bridegroom partake of that cup for the last time, and then they put it on the ground, and they both step on it together, sealing that covenantal relationship of marriage for eternity. None of these items that I've just mentioned are found in the Passover Seder. And I have shown you probably way too many times that during the Last Supper, there was no lamb that had been offered in sacrifice to God. There was no bitter herbs. There was no unleavened bread. 
I reiterate that at the modern Passover Seder, there are four individual covenantal cups. These are cups that are partaken of by everyone. The fifth cup, the cup of Elijah, that most Orthodox Jews observed, is not a communal cup, and nobody drinks out of that. That is reserved just in case Elijah shows up. And I also reiterate that Jesus commended us to observe the Last Supper every time we meet, every time we get together in fellowship, in remembrance of Him, and I would also add in remembrance of our betrothal contract with Him and with each other. The Passover Seder is only observed once a year, not every time we get together. So what does this mean? What does the Last Supper signify? Why is it important? I feel that the Last Supper was the most important ceremony ever conducted in biblical history. It is the very reason for our existence and our creation. God created man to be in his image and likeness, and his only begotten is that first man to come into his image and likeness. And in reward and in love for his son, our Heavenly Father wants to present his son with a bride. The reason for Passover was not only for the redemption of man, but it was also the price that Jesus paid for his bride. During the betrothal process, there is a dowry that the groom pays for the bride. Well, Jesus didn't have any money. He didn't have any property. He didn't have any wealth. The only thing he had was his very life, his own blood. And he gave that for his bride. He paid the ultimate price for his bride. And while on the cross, he refused wine that was meant to help dull the pain that he was going through. He refused it because he was following through on that betrothal protocol where the groom does not partake of wine until the marriage day. So Jesus chose to endure even greater pain while on the cross in order to fulfill that betrothal covenant. He loved his bride that much. And I find it a crying shame that most Christians don't realize that Jesus is offering them betrothal. And I find it even more of a shame that the church, church leaders, evangelists, theologians, teachers are clueless as to what the main purpose of the Last Supper was supposed to be, which was betrothal. Yes, we cannot disregard that one of the main points of the Last Supper was to establish the new covenant, which included salvation. That was one of the main foundational pillars. But the order and format and ceremony that Jesus observed was first and foremost a betrothal. And if we're not aware that that's what it was, then how do we prepare ourselves for that? How do we know that's even available to us? Matthew 22, a king is preparing a wedding feast for his son. That is God, our creator, our father, is preparing a wedding for Jesus Messiah. The sad part of that parable is that the servants that the father sends out, that this king sends out to give out invitations, these servants are cast aside. Some of them are killed. They are mocked and at least they're ignored. And this all by the constituents of the king. The king's citizens are the ones that turn against these servants, some to the point where the king burns down their cities. And the last thing that is said in that parable is many are called, or many are invited, but few are chosen. These are only the guests to the wedding. If there are many guests that are invited and only few show up, what does that say about the numbers that are attempting or know that they can be the bride? There are going to be even fewer in number that will be the bride. And I haven't even touched upon the ten virgins, the five wise and the five foolish. I guess what I'm asking is, if we don't even know there is a betrothal, that this betrothal is being offered to us, then how do we prepare for it? And if we don't prepare for it, then the chances of us being betrothed and eventually united with Jesus in that manner is drastically diminished. Many are invited, few are chosen. So what do we do in preparation during this betrothal if we accept the betrothal, if we open our door and let Christ in and he sups with us? How do we get there? Well, we get there by being led of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will lead you through the feasts of God. First being Passover. That is the blood covenant of the first cup. The second is Pentecost, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I mean the way the Apostle Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. The way that the Apostle John and Peter and Luke were filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2. That's the infilling I'm talking about. 
Jesus spoke of the ten virgins, the five wise, the five foolish. What was the key ingredient there of that passage, of that narrative that separated them from each other? It was oil. And the presence and the infilling of the Holy Spirit is synonymous with oil. Well, the bride also has oil. She needs to keep her lamp lit and held up during this betrothal process. It signifies her heart's intent to continue through this process and continue to pursue the lover of her soul, that being the groom. On a personal level, you have to go before the Lord and ask what needs to be done in your personal life to complete this preparing process. I strongly feel that the time is growing short, that the catching away of the bride is at hand. So before I complete this video, I would like to once again invite you to click on that i-card in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Just put your cursor up there, it'll pop up. Click on that and it'll direct you to a five part series which examines dozens of two moon and four moon dreams that people have had over the last many years. And we have come to see that these dreams are all pointing to a season which appears to be the taking of the bride and other rapture events and end time events. And it's clear in this five part video that the main emphasis is on the Song of Solomon. That is to say, a deep love relationship with Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Christ. And that only serves to highlight and emphasize the Last Supper, which was Jesus proposing to his people. The Last Supper was Jesus proposing. Revelation 3.20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come to him and sup with him and he with me. That is a betrothal proposal. I hope you open that door and invite him in. Maranatha.